Good afternoon. Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, and dear members of the Holst uh, family, um, and last but not least, uh, dear Dr. Watson. Uh, on behalf of Philips Lighting Research and the Eindhoven University of Technology, it's a great pleasure to me to welcome you all to the 2016 uh, Holst Memorial Lecture Award. We are honored that uh, Dr. Watson here is today um, as our Holst Lecturer and as a recipient of the 2016 Holst Memorial, Memorial Lecture Award. With the, uh, and actually you can, you can see it on display, it's, it's right there, that's, that's the award that we're going to hand out at the end of this uh, event. With the Holst uh, Lecture we commemorate Dr. Gilles Holst and uh, a picture is uh, at that site. In his own academic career, Shiel Holst played an important part in the discovery of superconductivity. At that time, working together with uh, Heike Kameling Onnes at the University of Leiden. And actually, the Nobel Prize uh, was awarded for this work later on. However, I guess uh, many of you uh, remember Shiel Holst as the founding director of Philips Research. And he worked there between 1914 and 1946. And I think he left an indelible mark on the culture and ways of working at Philips Research. And I can only confess that because I really enjoyed that myself during my tenure at uh, Philips Research. Holst was also a chairman of two committees that helped to establish this university, Eindhoven University of Technology. And actually at that time it was called the Technische Hogeschool. So when I started my education it was still the Technische Hogeschool and today it is the Eindhoven University of Technology. From today's perspective, we might consider Holst as a pioneer of what we call today open innovation. The fact that universities and industries work so closely together on, on real-life challenges is of tremendous importance uh, for our future and certainly also for our past. And I think the, uh, the joint flagships that we have today between our university and with the, I would say, the royal and the real, I now understand Philips research, are beautiful examples thereof. The Holst uh, Memorial Lectures themselves started in 1977. Unfortunately, we received the sad news that one of its initiators, Dr. Pannenborg, the former CTO of Philips, uh, who on this very spot received an honorary Holst medal only two years ago, passed away last Friday. And I think we've lost in him a man who was of great importance to this very region. The central theme that was chosen for this year's Hall's Memorial Lecture and the preceding symposium, I, I hope that many of you really have enjoyed that symposium, was quality of light. A timely theme, also in view of the GLOW event that's happening this week in Eindhoven and also at this particular campus. And I really can only invite you to have a walk along the campus, along all the events that we have in the, in the GLOW. During the symposium, four eminent speakers shared their vision on the challenges in the highly relevant lighting domain. A domain where so much is happening and so much is changing. Uh, from, say, making manufacturing light bulbs to really complicated systems that we're being designed to today. And I compliment this year's Holst Committee on the excellent program that they've put together and the TUE's uh, conference office for organizing the event that we have today here in Eindhoven. But let me introduce today's Holst Memorial Lecturer, the 14th in a row of eminent speakers. And the title he chose for his lecture is The Windows of Visibility. Before moving to Apple, the current employer, Andrew Watson was senior scientist at the Vision Research and director of the Vision Group at NASA Ames Research Center in Moffat, California. He studied perceptual psychology and physiology at Columbia University and at the University of Pennsylvania and did postdoctoral work at Cambridge and Stanford. His research encompasses applications to coding, understanding and display of visual information. He's the author of well over 100 scientific papers numerous patterns, and this uh, work uh, encompasses uh, human vision, visual neuroscience, image quality, and digital imaging. In 2001, he founded the Journal of Vision, where he now serves as editor-in-chief. 
He's received fellow awards from the Optical Society of America, the Association of Research on Vision and Ophthalmology, and Society of Information Display. He's the 2007 recipient of the Otto Schade Award from the Society of Information Display, and the 2008 winner of the Special Recognition Award from the Association for Research and Vision in opt Ophthalmology. In 2011, he received the Presidential Rank Award, a special award, I would say. And in 2014, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers Journal Award. So I think that the, the Holtz Memorial, Memorial Lecture Award in 2016 is once more the recognition of Dr. Watson's contribution to vision research. Congratulations. And now the floor is yours. First, I want to thank all the individuals who made it possible for me to be here, in particular Ingrid Hendricks and the other members of the committee. I am really grateful. I have very strong intellectual admiration for this particular establishment, both Phillips and the Technical University. As you'll see, some of the work that I'll be talking about is derived directly from work done here over the uh, past decades. So thank you very much for this uh, honor. I also, if you will indulge me, would like to make a personal note of thanks to my wife, who is here in the first row. We celebrated our 29th wedding anniversary two days ago. So. <clears throat> now, in the earlier parts of this symposium, we've heard a lot about casting light onto surfaces. Today, I'm going to be talking about taking back that light into the eye and making use of it. So a little bit of a different perspective on lighting. And as I say, I'll be talking about the windows of visibility and how limits to human vision can inform us in how to design imaging and visual technology. So I begin with a quote. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow gaps of his cavern. Now, there's this idea that if only we could see things more fully, we would take in more information. And I think, in fact, this is completely wrong. It's only through a process of winnowing and selection that human vision is able to operate at all. So we need these constraints on vision in order to select the relevant information. And we'll see that as we go along. So, the windows of visibility. Um, there's my picture of the windows of visibility. The first window that I'm going to talk about is a very simple one. It's just the field of view. So we're sitting here, standing here, and we're bathed in this sea of photons. And a few lucky photons make it to our pupil and enter the eye. Now, those photons, amazingly enough, get sorted out so that we know the direction from which each one of them came. And in fact, we create this little map on the back of our eye, on the retina, that we call the retinal image, which is a map of where the photons came from. And we do that through our optics, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But first, the point is that we only absorb light that's coming from a certain range of angles, our field of view. And in designing visual technology, of course, we make use of that. We don't put displays behind our back. And if, for example, you're designing a virtual reality system, you want to know exactly what the limits of that field of view are. So that's the first uh, window of visibility. Now, I mentioned optics. So that's this process by which we sort the photons and figure out where they came from so we can identify objects and surfaces and materials and things of that kind. So here's just a picture of the light traveling through the, the outer uh, optical surface of the cornea and then the uh, inner uh, crystalline lens, which then focuses the image on the back of the eye on the retina. Now, what are these strange looking blobs up on the screen. These are optical point spread functions 
from a collection of different human observers. They're actually all what we would call well-corrected human observers, meaning they're wearing their proper spectacle correction. And if you don't know what the point spread function of an optical system is, you could think of this as basically being the paintbrush with which you're painting the image on the back of your eye. So if you have a big smudgy point spread function, you're going to have a very blurry image on the back of your eye. If you have a nice sharp uh, point spread function, you will have a nice sharp image. Now, do I have a pointer here or is there, hmm. Maybe I can use the cursor. Yes, I can use the cursor here. So you can see this person here is going to have a nice uh, sharp image, but this person here is going to have a rather blurry image. So the first limitation on the, uh, the second window of visibility is the optical window, and it's going to, to some extent, blur the image and thus remove very high spatial frequencies, thus limiting the detail that we can see. And we'll talk about this a little more in a moment. But first, I want to point out that we now have very uh, straightforward machinery for computing the retinal image that would result from any particular combination of optical aberrations in your physiological optics, in your cornea and lens. This is just showing a simulation of an observer whose point spread function is shown there, and this is with zero diopters of defocus. So this would be, let's say, they've got their proper spectacle correction on. But suppose they had a half a diopter of defocus, then the point spread function would look like that, and this letter in the retinal image would be somewhat more blurred. By the way, these letters are sized according to the line on the letter chart, which is what we'd call in the US 2020 vision. Here, I guess it's six meters, but uh, so to speak, normal, well-corrected vision. And down here with two diopters, of course, you get quite a blurry image, and this person really should put their glasses back on. So the first, second window is the optical window. Now, after the retinal image is formed on the back of the eye and the retina, the light is, of course, absorbed by the uh, photoreceptors, which are over here at the back of the eye. And you have, of course, both the cone photoreceptors for bright light and the rod photoreceptors for dim light. And that leads us to the uh, next window of visibility, which is the wavelength window. And of course, in the total spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, we only are sensitive to a narrow band, the so-called visible spectrum, which is shown here, ranging from, say, around 700 nanometers to around 400 nanometers. Now, the window of wavelength is actually a little bit more extreme than that because, of course, we have just three types of photoreceptors, that is, of cone photoreceptors for bright vision, bright light vision, the uh, so-called red, green, and blue photoreceptors, or short wavelength, middle wavelength, and long wavelength, and their action spectra, or sensitivity spectra, are shown here as a function of wavelength. And this photomicrograph of the retina shows the distribution of those cone photoreceptors in one particular individual. And you can see they've got quite a few red cones and quite a few green cones, but very few blue cones. And that is, in fact, the nature of the human uh, distribution of cone photoreceptors. But the fact that the light out in the world is absorbed by just these three types of photoreceptors means that it's transformed from effectively an infinite dimensional space of wavelength into just a three-dimensional space of absorption by the red cone, absorption by the blue cone, and absorption by the green cone. So a further reduction in the amount of information that's actually getting to the brain. So what I'm showing here are three wavelength spectra. This is from a standard D65 lamp. Those of you who are, well, everyone here should know what a D65 lamp is. But uh, in any case, here's a metal halide lamp and here's a fluorescent lamp. And all three of these have very different wavelength spectra, as you can see. But all of them would appear to a human observer to be more or less white. And that's because after being transformed through the three types of phone, cone photoreceptors, they produce equivalent uh, photoreceptor absorptions in the three types of cones. So that's what we call the trichromacy window. 
Now, the next window is the intensity window, and this, is, of course, is very relevant to illumination and, and lighting. And the fact is that our visual system can, in principle, operate over this incredibly large range of light intensity, from, let's say, five, minus five log nits up to something like eight log nits, or log candelas per meter squared. But, of course, at any one time, it can only operate within a small region of that spectrum. And the way it works is it adapts. So if we move into a well-lit environment, then the visual system will light adapt to that environment. And then if we move back into a dimly lit environment, it will dark adapt back into the uh, dimmer environment. But at any one time, we only have a uh, two to three log unit range of operation of the visual system. So it's a further narrowing of our of our field of view, so to speak. <clears throat> now, going beyond that, we don't actually respond directly to light intensity in our visual system. It very early on in the process gets transformed into contrast between light and dark. And so here's a, an image, just a, a, a grayscale image of a butterfly. And what I want to do is to transform that into a contrast image. And a simple way of doing that is by taking this image and blurring it. So there's a blurred version. And now we're going to subtract those two images. And the image on the right is basically the luminance at a point minus the average luminance in its neighborhood. So it's the difference between a point and its, and its neighborhood. And that's what we call luminance contrast. And very early on in the retina, the neurons of the retina perform this kind of transformation. So we're not really ever responding to absolute luminance. We're responding to luminance differences or contrast. And that's what I'm calling the contrast window. Now, the next step is um, a very important one for the further development of this presentation. So I want you to appreciate that images can actually, like musical notes, be decomposed or like musical sounds, can be decomposed into pure tones, sinusoids. Although in this case, they're sinusoidal variations of luminance over space. And they can vary in both spatial frequency, that is how rapid the stripes vary over space, and also their orientation. So here I'm showing a particular sinusoidal variation. And uh, if you were at the correct viewing distance, this would be four cycles per degree. Uh, you probably all know this, but your thumb is about two degrees of visual angle across. So if you held up your thumb and, and two thumbs covered that image, then that would be about four degrees across. But at any rate, that's one spatial frequency. And what we can do is we can measure the sensitivity of the visual system to sinusoids of this kind, and thereby we measure how sensitive we are to detail in images of different scales. Fine detail will be reflected in very rapid sinusoidal variations, and coarse detail in very slow changing sinusoidal variations. And the way we do that is by doing an experiment in which we reduce the contrast of that sinusoidal grading until you can no longer see it. And at the point at which that occurs, we call that the contrast threshold, and the inverse of that is what we call contrast sensitivity. So the graph on the right is showing that there were quite sensitive to variations in this middle range of uh, from four to ten cycles per degree. But as we go to these high spatial frequencies, we become less and less sensitive until finally, at somewhere around 50 or 60 cycles per degree, we can't see anything at all. So that's another boundary of a window of visibility. We simply can't sense information that is at higher spatial frequencies or smaller spatial scales than around 60 cycles per degree. Now, the same is true in the time domain. So just as we can have variations of luminance over space, we can have variations of luminance over time. And here's an example of a patch of uh, the screen that's sinusoidally varying in luminance over time. And down below it is a graph of how it's changing over time. And just in the same way, we can measure the sensitivity of the human observer to these kinds of fluctuations. And if we do that, we get a graph that looks, uh, oh, here's a more rapid fluctuation. 
But if we do that, we get a graph that looks remarkably similar to the one I showed you for spatial variations. But now the horizontal axis is temporal frequency in hertz rather than cycles per degree in, uh, in, in the spatial frequency domain. And you're most sensitive to frequencies around 5 or 10 hertz. And your sensitivity falls off to effectively zero at something like uh, 60 hertz. Now, we'll see that can vary depending on conditions. But that, again, is another bound to a window of visibility. Now, we can, of course, combine these two things into something we can call spatiotemporal frequency. So here's a spatially sinusoidal grating, but it's also modulating sinusoidally in time. And it turns out that if you think about a sequence of imagery in space and time, you can Fourier transform it into a collection of spatial and temporal sinusoids. So uh, by measuring sensitivity to these kinds of patterns, we can get a sense of how the human observer is sensitive to the interaction between spatial and temporal frequency. So here's a higher uh, spatial frequency and a lower temporal frequency, and there's, that's both high and spatial and temporal frequency. So what does the sensitivity to those things look like? Well, here's some data collected quite a few years ago by a colleague in, in Cambridge, England, John Robson. And what these graphs are showing, each one of these colored curves, is a contrast sensitivity function. In this case, these are spatial contrast sensitivity functions, and this is spatial frequency in cycles per degree. And the color is telling us which temporal frequency was used. And you notice the curves all have kind of the same shape, but as the frequency in time gets higher, your sensitivity goes down. The curves on the right are exactly the same thing, but with the two dimensions flipped. So now this is temporal frequency here, and this is spatial frequency as the parameter. Now, I want to point out something, which is that the slope of these curves, in the way that I've plotted it, which is log sensitivity against linear frequency, they're all more or less straight lines. Not only that, the slope of the line, in this case, doesn't depend on which temporal frequency we're using. And the slope with respect to, spa with respect to temporal frequency doesn't depend on which spatial frequency we're using. So this is a remarkable uh, simplification. And what it allows us to do is now draw a picture of the spatio-temporal window of visibility. And what it looks like is a rectangular pyramid Remarkably simple. The sides are just planar surfaces, and there's a linear trade-off between spatial and temporal frequency. Now, I hope at least some of you in the audience appreciate how valuable a construction is of this kind when designing imaging technology. Because after all, we're always trying to render information that's visible to the human and remove artifacts that we don't want to be visible. And this tells us what is visible. Only the stuff within the pyramid is visible. Everything outside it is not visible to the human observer. Now I want to draw your attention to the floor of the pyramid, that green square. That's, uh, the, the vertical axis is contrast. And the floor is where the contrast is maxed out. You can't make the contrast any bigger. So that floor tells us the total range of spatial and temporal frequencies that can be seen no matter how big you make the contrast. That's the limit. And we call that green square the window of visibility. Of course, my whole talk is about windows of visibility, but we use that term specifically to refer to that green area. And you'll see it has really powerful implications. Now, what happens to the window of visibility if we change the illumination? After all, we're here today to talk about light and illumination and how that affects our visual performance. Well, it turns out that has been studied, and in fact, it was done in two remarkably significant papers, and I want to draw your attention to where these papers came from, okay? This is by DeLange, Philips Research Labs, in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, okay, November 1958. And here's the second paper I'll talk about. Uh, this is by Floris van Ness, who I'm amazingly honored to tell you is here in the audience today, but he is also working here in, the, uh, in Utrecht, but in the Netherlands. And so what were these two papers about? Well, they basically were measuring 
the spatial and temporal contrast sensitivity functions that I just described, but showing how they changed as you changed the illumination. And so on the left, here's the graphs of DeLonga, and he's talking about how te temporal sensitivity changes, and each colored curve is for a different level of average illumination. And the top curve is for the brightest one, and the bottom for the dimmest. So you'll not be surprised to know that as you increase the illumination, you become more sensitive to variations in contrast. And that's why we, generally speaking, will prefer better illumination if we're trying to see information in, a, in, a, in an environment. Um, I want to draw your attention again to the fact that if you plot log sensitivity against linear temporal frequency, these curves are still straight lines. And not only that, the slope doesn't change as a function of the level of illumination. We'll come back to that in a second. On the right is a very similar graph. This one is for spatial sensitivity. And again, we're just changing the illumination to a number of different values. And the curves are again more or less straight lines. And the slope does not depend upon the illumination. Now, I'll tell you another amazing fact about these curves, which is the separation between these curves is a linear function of the retinal illuminance. In other words, the way the curves separate from each other is extremely well behaved with respect to the level of illumination. And what that means is that if we go back to our pyramid of visibility, that means that as we change the illumination, this is what happens. The pyramid simply rises and sinks into the desert, if you will, if I can indulge in a metaphor. And, um, of course, the higher the illumination, the higher the pyramid, and the lower the illumination, the lower the pyramid. But look at the window of visibility, the green area. So what that's telling you is that as the illumination is decreased, the size of the window of visibility, the range, the total range of spatial and temporal frequencies that can be seen is diminished. So usually we think of opening a window to let in more light, but here we're letting in more light to open a window. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Uh, all right. That's how illuminance affects the uh, window visibility. <clears throat> now, uh, what about contrast? So remember, contrast is in the vertical dimension, and the green square is the window of visibility, uh, typically when the contrast is at a maximum. But suppose your system is such in, that you can't produce contrast greater than 10%. Well, then the floor will lift up to the this is a log scale, so that would go up to a level of one. So you can see that lowering the contrast reduces the size of the window of visibility, and it actually does it linearly with respect to log contrast. So this very simple model, which is, of course, an approximation, is remarkably well behaved with respect to contrast, luminance, spatial frequency, and temporal frequency. And that allows us to do amazingly simple engineering calculations when we want to know, for example, will this display appear to flicker? Will this display appear to have motion artifacts? Will this display appear to have other kinds of spatial sampling artifacts? And I'll show you examples in a moment. All right. Now, I want to move on to another window of visibility, which has to do with the variation in spatial resolution of the visual system as a function of eccentricity or distance from your point of fixation. So in the upper curve, you see a photomicrograph of cone photoreceptors near to your point of fixation. And they're small, and they're beautifully packed into a nice hexagonal lattice. And you can see the scale there. That arrow up there is two arc minutes. So each, the separation between adjacent cone photoreceptors is on the order of a half a minute of arc which leads, of course, or is related to the limit of 60 cycles per degree in, in uh, our spatial resolution. But now if we go out some distance on the retina from your fovea, we see the picture below. And the uh, little uh, 
uh, objects there are not actually cones. Those are rods, which begin to fill in in between the cones. The cones are those big fat things. So the cones both get farther apart and they get larger as you move away from the fovea. Uh, and in fact, that process is quite extreme. So on the uh, left there, you can see a graph, a, a, a cross section of the density of cones per square millimeter of retina as a function of distance from the center of your point of fixation in degrees of visual angle. And you can see it's, it's plummeting from 200,000 down to you know, uh, 10, 20,000 when you're only five or 10 degrees away from the point of fixation. So five or 10 degrees is only a modest distance. And in the, in the uh, right, you see a uh, two-dimensional depiction of this spike of resolution. So we don't have uniform resolution. We, and we have another window, which is this very limited aperture for high resolution vision. Uh, these these uh, images here are just showing some different uh, 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 distances from, from uh, the fovea. This is one and a quarter degrees, four degrees, and 10 degrees. And again, you can see the increasing separation between the photoreceptors. Now, an important point, however, if we can go back to our picture of the, of the retina, is that the photoreceptors do not actually set the resolution limit to the visual system because the output neurons of the visual system are the retinal ganglion cells. And they convey information up the optic nerve to your brain. And anything that doesn't get on board the optic nerve doesn't get to your brain. So their sampling is what actually limits the spatial resolution of the visual system. Now in the fovea, there's actually a one-to-one -one relationship between cone photoreceptors and retinal ganglion cells. So there's no uh, further reduction in resolution. But in the periphery, ganglion cells collect signals from a, uh, a neighborhood of cone photoreceptors, so they further reduce the resolution of the visual system. So we really need to look at the density of the retinal ganglion cells. And this is a, uh, a function that we actually developed to describe that density. And again, you can see it's a spike. This is the total field of view of one eye, uh, horizontal degrees of visual angle, vertical degrees, and the density, and that's done in log units, log to the base two. But you can see there's a very, uh, uh, sorry, log to the base 10, uh, enormous change in the density of the ganglion cells as you go from the center to the periphery. Now, this is a picture of that collection area I was talking about of the ganglion cells. So the collection area in the fovea is tiny, one cone, but in the periphery, you're collecting over a very large area, as, as shown by this large blue circle. And what that does, of course, is to blur the image. So here we're starting with a NASA-oriented photograph in full resolution, uniform resolution across its extent. And now if we blur that image according to eccentricity, it should still be in focus at the very center. Uh, but if you go off to the margins, of course, it'll be very blurred. And if you were at the correct viewing distance, this would be correctly blurred for your particular eccentricity. Now, remember I said there's also a conversion to contrast. So if we take that image and now convert it from color and luminance to luminance and color contrast, it would look something like this. And we're just accentuating the edges and just conveying that information. Now there's one other thing that is an attribute of the sampling by the retinal ganglion cells. And it is that uh, because there are fewer cells in the periphery, the effect of noise is greater. If you think about the central limit theorem, it tells you that the more samples you have, the less noise you have. Well, in the periphery, you have few samples, so you have effectively more noise. So we can simulate that by producing a noise that looks like that, where it increases with eccentricity. So if we put all that together, here's a kind of a simulation of the information that might be conveyed by the retinal ganglion cells when you're fixating at the very center of this, of this image. Now, uh, oh, I just want to mention that we can actually incorporate this change with eccentricity into our model of the pyramid of visibility, and that's shown here. What we're doing is we're showing different versions of the pyramid for different retinal locations. So as you go into the periphery, 
the spatial limits of the window shrink. The temporal limits remain the same. So you go into this uh, kind of diamond-shaped uh, thing. But one can actually use this to do calculations for peripheral, spatial, and temporal sensitivity. Now, uh, this is just an, uh, a new picture of the field of view, pointing out that we don't have uniform resolution over that field of view, but just a spike in the center. Now I want to turn to the question of how we make use of this information. And basically, we have a very simple model. We're kind of adapting this famous quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And here's my version. What you cannot see, you cannot see. Okay? It's that simple. So, uh, more seriously, the idea is that we take an image, let's say an image on a display, and we put it through all those windows that I've described, and, and these are all computational tools, you know, all of these are implemented in terms of software, so we can compute what the image would look like, and we produce what we call a neural image, which is effectively a representation of that same image as it might exist on the optic nerve traveling to the brain. Sometimes we simulate higher levels in the brain, in the cortex, but for now we're just going to talk about the retina. Now, how do we use this in, in, in designing imaging systems? Well, frequently we're making a choice between two designs. And in those cases, what we can do is compute the neural image for one design, the neural image for the other design, take the difference between them, and see, after adding up those differences, whether the total result, this is some sort of psychological measure of difference, whether that's going to be visible or not. And if it's not visible, well, then we don't need to worry about it. And if this sounds a little abstract, I'll show you uh, concrete examples in a moment. Now, I wanted to begin with a trivial example that you're all familiar with already, just to get our feet wet. So this is an example of how we always create color images in, in, uh, in electronic technology by creating separate primary images, usually red, green, and blue, and adding them together to produce our full color image. But of course, we do that because we know about the trichromacy window of the visual system, that only three components are necessary to render the full spectrum of visible colors. Um, now let's talk about another example, image compression. So here's an example on the left of a, 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 a nice high quality image. And depending where you are in the room, the one on the right might also look high quality, maybe the people in the back. <laughs> But in any case, the amount of information required to represent these two images is massively different. The one on the left, 1.2 megabytes, and the one on the right, 12 kilobytes, or a factor of 100 reduction in the number of bits required to represent the two images. And of course, all imagery that you see nowadays on your smartphone, on your tablet, on your laptop, on your streaming TV, it's all compressed. And the goal is always to compress it as much as possible but not too much. So how do we know what's too much? Well, in a perfect world, we use a model of the visual system to tell us when it's too much. So how does, how does compression work? Just a, a little tutorial here. Uh, what we do is we, we take an image. This is the example of JPEG compression, which is very widely used. We take an image. We break it up into little blocks of 8 by 8 pixels. Each one of these is 8 by 8 pixels. And now I'm taking one of those 8 by 8 blocks over here so you can see it more clearly. And we actually transform that into essentially the frequency domain. So earlier I was talking about how images can be represented by sinusoidal components. Well, here that's what we're doing. And uh, I won't try and explain what all these uh, gray levels mean in here, but roughly speaking, the high frequencies are down here and the low frequencies are down here. And we're more sensitive to the low frequencies to the high, than the high, so we can afford to turn down the accuracy of rendition of the high frequencies. And what these three uh, arrays are here are what are called the quantization matrices. And you can just think of them as a whole bunch of knobs that you can turn to control the accuracy with which each frequency is rendered. And black in this picture means that it's being rendered accurately, and light gray means it's being rendered poorly. So we're not going to render the high frequencies accurately. We're only going to render the low frequencies accurately. After we do that, the resulting uh, Fourier uh, DCT coefficients look like this. We convert them back into a, uh, a, an array of 8 by 8 pixels. We put it back in its correct place. 
we put all the eight by eight pixel blocks back together and we get this. So this looks pretty bad, but of course I'm just trying to illustrate how the process occurs. Now, I think I have a live example here where we can actually show how this works. So if I increase the compression of this picture, what you're seeing on the left is that collection of knobs. And there are eight by eight knobs, so 64 total knobs. And again, the high frequencies are down here and the low frequencies are up here. And uh, again, if I increase the amount of compression, you can see the knobs are all being turned together and the image is getting worse and the amount of information required to represent the image is getting less. Now back to the windows of visibility. What does that have to do with this? Well, remember, we already have a model for the sensitivity of the visual system to different spatial frequencies. So we can design this quantization matrix, these set of knobs, to perfectly render the compression in such a way that the human can't see the artifacts. And I won't explain how we do this, but we can actually do it on an image by image basis, not just for um, uh, all images. So uh, if we go on to the next slide, so this describes the technology that we developed to do this where it automatically adjusts the quantization for each image to perfectly adapt to the visual system of the human observer. Okay, so that's the first example of how we can use these windows of visibility to enhance imaging technology. <clears throat> Now the second example has to do with high frame rate movies. And some of you may have seen uh, an earlier attempt at high frame rate movies. The, the Hobbit wasn't very well received. But believe me, high frame rate movies are going to become uh, the, uh, uh, the natural medium. Um, now here's a low frame rate movie. I don't know if any of you know what this is. The music is not original. This is the first movie ever made. And uh, it shows the workers leaving the uh, factory of the creator of this movie, the uh, Lumiere brothers, and there's their, one of their early cameras. They actually used the same device, I think, for taking the movie and projecting it, but in any case. Uh, so the important point here is that from the very earliest days of film, video, all these things, it's always stroboscopic. That is to say, we're always actually showing a sequence of still images and relying on the visual system to stitch them together into a smooth appearing rendition. And the critical question from day one has always been, how many frames do we need per second in order to make it smooth? And there's been a lot of uh, uh, loose ideas about what the answer to that question is. But we believe that using the window of visibility, you can actually compute the answer. And in fact, you can design optimal solutions. Now what I'm showing here is a 500 frame per second movie being shown to you at 50 frames per second. The reason we're doing this is we're gonna use this 500 frame per second movie to simulate frame rates of various speeds so you can see what they, what they look like. So first let's look at 10 hertz. Not very good. Right? Very jerky, very uh, not smooth motion at all. Here's 25 hertz, definitely getting better, uh, but still a little bit jerky, I think you'll agree. Now here's uh, 50 hertz, uh, the, until recently anyway, the European standard for television. And uh, it's, it's pretty smooth, but I think you'll still see some jerkiness. Now, there's another parameter here, which I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but it has to do with how long you leave the shutter open when you capture each frame. And of course, if you leave the shutter open for a long time, the image will be blurred during each frame, but actually the motion will appear smoother. So here's a simulation of 25 hertz with a shutter that's open during the whole extent of the frame. This produces what we call motion blur, and it's also a problem when you're displaying the imagery, for example, on a, something like a liquid crystal display where the display remains illuminated for the whole duration of the frame. But it's another one of the challenges in, in uh, producing smooth motion on displays. Now, how do we address this problem? Um, we go back to the pyramid of visibility. And remember that green square at the bottom, the window of visibility? Let's bring that up and look at it face on. 
And again, the axes here are spatial frequency and temporal frequency. And within the yellow region is what you can see, and outside you can't see. And there are two limits here, the spatial frequency limit and the temporal frequency limit. Now, what does this have to do with fra high frame rate movies? Well, if we take a very simple movie, that of a moving line going across the screen, it's got a particular speed, and we're now going to represent that in that domain of spatial and temporal frequencies. So how do we do that? Well, first we start with a stationary line, and the spectrum for a stationary line has, uh, 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 looks like this. As, as this is the spatial domain, this is the time domain. The line isn't moving, so its spatial position remains constant. And in the frequency domain, it has spatial frequencies covering the full spectrum but all the temporal frequency energy is concentrated at zero, which kind of sounds intuitively correct. No motion, zero temporal frequency. I've drawn the window of visibility on top of this picture, and you'll see why in a moment. Let's now put the line in motion. What happens to the line? Well, here's the map of the contrast of the line over space and time. It looks like an oblique line. And the spectrum actually also looks like an oblique line, and it's at right angles to the the space-time diagram. And you can see that part of it goes through the window of visibility. Now remember, this part out here won't be visible, only the part within the window. Now, so far we're talking about a smoothly moving line, but let's make a movie of it. Let's capture samples in space and time. What happens to the spectrum then? Well, in space-time it looks like this. We've got just discrete presentations at locations in space and time. In the frequency domain, what that does is it multiplies the spectrum. It produces replicas of the spectrum at intervals of the frame rate. In this case, 24 hertz. Now, you notice these bits of spectrum here and here. They're falling within the window. That means they're visible. And they're different from the spectrum that was there when it was smoothly moving. Those are the spectral components that are the artifact that make the line appear jerky. So what can we do to get rid of them? Well, of course, we can increase the frame rate. Okay, now the, all the spectral replicas are outside the window of visibility. And I'm not going to uh, uh, belabor this too much, but all of the processes involved in capturing, rendering, processing, and displaying information can be depicted in this scenario, and you can see what the consequences are. And I'll just show you one example. This is that business about shutter angle, how long you leave the aperture open on the camera, or how long you leave the display static on the screen. And on the left, we're showing uh, a, um, a case of a, a brief shutter, and we've got a lot of replicas in, in the window of visibility because we've got rapid motion, and we've got a low frame rate. So this is going to look terrible. And over here, what we've done is we've elongated the shutter angle, or the aperture time, to the full extent of the frame, and we've at least gotten rid of a lot of the artifact. Not all of it, but a lot of it. All right, so that's, that's another example of how we can uh, use uh, the windows of visibility to optimize the design of imaging technology. And as I said, all these aspects of, of capturing and displaying uh, imagery can be displayed in this, uh, in this scenario. Now I want to move on to another one, which is the idea of display inspection. Now, displays. We're living in the world of displays, right? You've got, you're probably carrying one or several on your person right now. You've got your watch, you've got your phone, you've got your tablet. Um, this is an old slide. You know, we've gone, we've got digital cinema now. Um, but the number of displays in the world today is just astonishing. This, is, again, is an out-of-date slide. But this is 2011, okay, we're in 2016. 750 million large flat panels. This is production. 250 million LCD TVs. Um, if you add all these numbers up, you know, there's only like six billion people in the world, right? I mean, where are these all going? But anyway, um, there's enormous number of displays. When they are being manufactured, there's always the issue of maintaining the quality of the display. And many displays are inspected for quality. And in fact, up until fairly recently, most uh, uh, or many of these displays were inspected by humans. Think about that. Inspecting a billion displays a year by humans 
It's simply not supportable. And these displays, of course, as you, I'm here at Phillips and you have history in this area, but these displays are made in these enormous fabrication facilities where everything is completely automated except the inspection. And at the end of the day, they pick up a panel and they look at it and they draw grading marks on it. And uh, so what we wanted to do was to try to automate that final step in the process, again, by using a model of the uh, visual observer, because what we want is an inspection system that is no less sensitive than the human, but no more sensitive either. We want it to be exactly the same as the human. You don't want to correct errors that the human can't see. Now, one form of defect in displays is what's called mura, which is a, a Japanese word meaning uh, smudge or blemish. And uh, it happens for various reasons in the display manufacturing process. But as I say, it was often inspected for using human inspectors. Now, another problem is as displays get larger and larger, you can't pick them up, right? And you can't really scan them. It's just it's too much real estate to look at. So we need automated inspection, and we want it to match human performance. Well, so what we did was put a model based on some of the technologies I've described to you into a system where we would take an image of a display and we would put it through various uh, preliminary operations. Don't worry about them. And this here is the heart of the matter, this matter the spatial standard observer, which is a technology we, we patented. And that produces this thing called the just noticeable difference map. And what that's telling you is whether any defects are visible and if they are, where they are and how big the defect is. So this map is measured in units of just noticeable difference. Um, here's a, an actual display, and you can see there's a, a, a problem there, and there's some weird thing there, and so forth. And if we put that through our, uh, our system, here's the output of the uh, metric, the spatial standard observer, and you can see it's identifying the location of the defects, and this scale over here is in units of just noticeable difference. So that's very valuable for these manufacturing facilities to be able to do that. In fact, it's been incorporated in some uh, uh, actual uh, products. All right, I think uh, I may have time for one more. Do I have, is, is Ingrid here? Do I have time for one more? Oh, okay. Uh, Task-based imaging system quality. So when we talk about image quality, we often mean, you know, how good does it look? Will people buy this television in the showroom? You know, do they like the way this picture looks? But there's another meaning to image quality, which is, are we able to complete a task using this particular image? And um, so that's much more difficult to measure. You can't just ask people. You can go and actually ask them to perform the task, but that's uh, very expensive in terms of manpower. So I got into this problem when dealing with a problem of the, uh, the US Navy. Nothing I'm telling you is classified. Um, and they were interested in uh, the fact that uh, they've replaced the periscopes on their submarines, which used to be beautiful optical instruments, with electronic systems. So they have a, a camera out in the world, and they've got a bunch of wires, and then they have a display inside the submarine. And this was all implemented a number of years ago, and when they finished, they observed that the quality was much inferior to what they'd previously had with the optical systems. And they wanted to understand what are the factors that go into uh, yielding quality in this uh, electronic system. So if you look at this uh, thing here, you've got, uh, you know, there's a, uh, an object out here in the world, there's illumination, there's background, there's atmosphere. Uh, and then you've got this optical system, and that's got these various components, uh, a, a, an optical system, a detector, and some signal processing, maybe some communication, video processing. And then finally, down at the end, they had this thing called the observer. And that was meant to lead to the probability of your being able to identify or detect that object out in the world. And the people who were working on this problem at the Navy, they understood how to do all the other stuff, the, sim, the, the uh, signal processing and the optics, but they didn't know how to do the modeling of the observer, and they came to me, and that's where I got involved on that little part of the problem. So how do we do that? Well, these are the kind of images they're dealing with. These are small watercraft, and they wanted to know, would an observer be able to identify? These are all distinct watercraft, 
And they'd actually conducted experiments with sailors, training them to identify these watercraft. And then they would degrade the imagery in various ways by blurring it or adding noise and uh, seeing whether the sailors could still identify these watercraft. But again, we wanted to automate that process. So what we did was we worked with what I'm calling here the template model. And let me just explain how that works. It's, it's pretty simple. Here's our target coming in. Let's suppose the target is just a letter instead of one of those watercraft. First, we go through an optical filter. Well, I already described how we can simulate that. Then we go through a neural filter, which we do by simulating the action of those retinal ganglion cells that I was describing. And we end up with a neural image. And then we add uh, neural noise. Again, it increases with eccentricity. And we get a noisy neural image. And then we imagine the observer has a bunch of templates. Those are shown below, which are effectively the neural images they would have got had the target been one of the other letters. And then they do a simple matching, template matching operation. And uh, if they're correct, they get the right answer. Now, what I want to show you here is just a very quick simulation of this particular watercraft as it proceeds through the uh, simulation at different sizes. So one of the problems we're interested in is how well are you able to identify these watercraft when they vary in size? Because sometimes they're going to be far away and tiny. Sometimes they'll be up close, but because of atmospheric conditions, you might still not see them. So we need to understand that. So here's what it would look like in the neural image at a uh, half a degree. It's a tiny watercraft very far away. As the watercraft gets bigger, the contrast of the edges increases because it's no longer being blurred as much. It's bigger. Those edges are no longer being blurred. But you'll see the noise begins to predominate. So it gets very large. This is now 64 degrees large. It's dominated by that noise. Okay? And that's the last one, 128 degrees. Now, before we went to actually trying to predict the visibility and identifiability of these uh, watercraft, we thought we'd start with something simpler. Letters. So there's an enormous literature on the human ability to identify letters. But we're going to take a different approach. We're going to put them through our model and see if we can predict the human ability to identify letters. And as I say, a lot of data on this subject. If you look at that column on the right, those are uh, a dozen or so studies over the last 50 years on identifying letters as a function of their size. These are all varying size and they're varying the contrast. And this graph here is showing you how much contrast you need to identify the letters. This is the log of the contrast. And this is the log of the letter size in degrees. So this zero means one degree letters. Again, that's half the width of your thumb at arm's length. So at this end of the graph, you can see your sensitivity is falling off. Each of these colored uh, things is a different data set. This is where you're getting the letters so small that they're being limited by your optics and your acuity, and that's why your sensitivity falls off. The curious thing is that it also falls off when they get really big. Now, why does that happen? Well, as we'll see, it's partly because as they get bigger, their edges move farther out into the periphery where you're less sensitive and there's less noise. Um, I want to point out another thing, which is Blomert, another uh, uh, piece of data collected here in Eindhoven. Eindhoven uh, Blomert and Timmers, I think it was. Uh, in any case, all those colored points are data. The big fat red curve is the predictions of our model. Okay, And I should say that the model had zero free parameters. Zero. Okay? So we were quite happy with that. And again, what the model is doing is we're actually doing a Monte Carlo simulation of presenting letters and having the model tell us what the letter was. We mark it as correct or incorrect. We repeat that over many trials and estimate contrast thresholds for the model for letters of different sizes. So the model worked very well. And uh, here's the uh, citation for uh, Blomert and Timmers from IPO in Eindhoven, 1987. Uh, now, uh, finally, uh, we turned our attention to, we, we, before we actually worked on watercraft, we said, well, what about images of aircraft? Letters, after all, are extremely simple. They're 
binary. They're either black or white. There's no grayscale. Very simple contours, very low complexity. What about something more complicated with grayscale like images? We'd uh, like images of aircraft. And we previously worked on these images, so we had them sitting around the lab. So we actually conducted experiments on human observers for these, action, asking them to identify these aircraft. And we then simulated the same process on the model, and this is the, this is the result, okay? Again, a very good prediction of the identifiability of the aircraft as a function of size and contrast based just on simple ideas from the window of visibility. Um, I think that's my last slide, so I just want to say thank you very much and again to say what an honor it is to be presenting this lecture in front of this audience in this particular location. It is really very moving to me and I thank you very much. Now I have the honor to talk to you. So first of all, thank you for your excellent speech, which makes me and maybe many of us aware of how unaware we are observing things. What's happening in the brain watching your presentation is incredible. Thank you very much. So on behalf of uh, Philips Lighting, on behalf of the Eindhoven University, uh, on behalf of the committee that selected the award winner this year, I would like to say a few words. So the intention was that Eric Rondelat, the CEO of Lighting, would be here, but he is locked up in a meeting in London, so he apologizes, and I'm to stand up to, uh, to talk to you. Um, so first of all, we heard today that Lighting has never been so relevant uh, as, as before. It, it has always been relevant, but the opportunities you have with Lighting these days are incredible. By technology advancements, uh, by the ledification, but also the connecting to the digital world. Yeah. Uh, lighting means economic development, we heard. Yeah. Where we bring light, we see economic development. Uh, the energy footprint is incredibly Im important, but also applications beyond illumination, where we use the lighting infrastructure to do more things uh, using the infrastructure in cities, in offices, etc. But above all, lighting is about people. It's about human-centric lighting, and I think you brought the light in our eyes and say, hey, this is how we perceive light. And we should never forget that, and the opportunities of working on human-centric lighting have only increased recently. So already more than 100 years ago, actually 102 years ago, Holst started the work on lighting research. It's not about just manufacturing, we wanted to know more about light, light sources. Um, and Holst was a real scientist, so he, he was the founder of Philips Research. And he has inspired many scientists, and he has shown many technological uh, opportunities. Also, Holst worked not only in the lab, but also outside the lab, involving other scientists, academia, and uh, working uh, and learning from others is, is uh, extremely important. So we learned today uh, that, that perception is incredibly important, and your work at Ames uh, Research uh, and I think Apple got it by hiring you. Also, perception for the modern displays is extremely important. Um, so, my compliments, uh, and it shows that research is important. And I'm talking on behalf of Eric Rondelot. Maybe that the fact that I'm saying it is a bit suspicious, but I can assure you that, <laughs> <laughs> that the vision in Philips Lighting Research is, or in Philips Lighting, is that research is important for the future. So, it's my pleasure to hand over the award to you. It's a creation by uh, artist Jos Reniers. It's a, it's a penning. And you had eminent predecessors. Actually, some of them won the Nobel Prize. I'm not sure it's a guarantee, but at, <laughs> least, at least it's a recognition for important work in this, uh, in this area. And the, the last one that won the Nobel Prize was Shiji Nakamura, and he was the inventor of the blue LED that is now lighting up our world. Um, so I would like to uh, invite you and hand over the Holst Award penning to you. And I hope it's an inspiration also for all the young scientists that are going to step in your foot, uh, footprint and work continuously on innovation. Thank you very much and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
Once again, I, I don't have any prepared remarks and I'm literally speechless, but uh, again, the significance of this award in this place can't be overestimated. It's amazing. Thank you again.